Good morning, Church of the Covenant. Good morning. And happy fifth Sunday of Easter. I'm overjoyed beyond words to welcome my family here today. My parents are back with us, and my sisters and nephews and in-laws from both sides are all visiting this weekend to celebrate my graduation from Boston University School of Theology. It is a first to have them all here together, and I am so thankful. They've also never heard me preach before, so the pressure is on this morning. Thank you all for helping make this day possible. I'm also pleased to report that as of yesterday, I have officially mastered divinity. <laughs> or so the paperwork tells me. <laughs> it seemed a shame not to wear uh, the snazzy regalia again this morning. I figured I should get all the mileage out of the hood and gown I can, right? <laughs> I also want to highlight the stole that I am wearing. Those of you familiar with Protestant polity will know that as an aspiring yet still unordained minister, I am not supposed to be wearing the symbol of ordination and the yoke of Christ and Christian service yet. I beg your forgiveness this morning to allow me the opportunity to wear this particular stole on this particular morning. It was given to me this past Wednesday at the Lavender graduation ceremony put on by Sacred Worth, the LGBTQ plus student organization at the School of Theology. It is the first such ceremony to be held at the School of Theology and at Boston University in general. The Lavender Graduation Ceremony was created by Dr. Rani Sanlo, a Jewish lesbian in 1996 when she was denied the opportunity to attend the graduation of her biological children because of her sexual orientation. Queer people graduating from seminary is still, unfortunately, a radical act. And I'm sure you can all imagine the solemnity and emotion of the experience. Inspired by Nathan Bakken, who many of you know, I wear this stole this morning to honor all of my queer siblings who have walked the halls of STH before me and alongside me and who have yet to come. Those who have been able to be open about who they are and those forced to remain in the closet. I wear it this morning to remind myself of how far I have come on my journey to claim my faith and my identity together as gifts from God. And I wear it this morning to hope for the future that we can build a world together where everyone is loved and celebrated for who they are, and no one will have to fear for their safety, their careers, or the love of their family and friends. Please pray with me. God of new beginnings, who journeys with us through all moments and at all times, Fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning. Inspire our thoughts. Be on our lips and in our ears. And set our hearts aflame with love for you and for your creation. May the meditations of all of our hearts and minds be acceptable and fruitful in your sight. Amen. Amen. While reading through the lectionary scriptures for today, my mind has been particularly caught up with the setting of this passage from Acts. I have Joppa on my mind, if you will. <laughs> so that is where I feel compelled to begin my sermon today. I don't know how many of us here this morning are familiar with this ancient city, and I'm fighting my inner teacher instinct to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> Joppa, it turns out, is an eastern Mediterranean port city, one of the oldest port cities in the world, actually. It is currently located in the heart of the nation of Israel and officially is part of the Tel Aviv metropolitan area. Jaffa is known as Jaffa or Yaffa in Arabic or Yafo in Hebrew. And the area that eventually became Tel Aviv or the Tel Aviv Yafo municipality was settled by Jews on the outskirts of Jaffa starting in the latter half of the 19th century. 
The English translation of the Bible preserves the Greek name for the city, Joppa, which for all of you Greek mythology buffs out there is linked to Jopea or Cassiopeia, who was the mother of Andromeda from the legend of Perseus. According to local legend, Andromeda was changed to an outcropping of rocks still visible in the Jaffa harbor. Joppa is also connected to several biblical stories, including serving as the port of departure for Jonah as he set out for Tarshish, and Joppa is the port where the cedars of Lebanon are said to have arrived for the building of Solomon's temple, and again for the second temple. Jaffa is important to me personally for a couple of reasons. It was sort of accidentally the first place I visited after arriving in Tel Aviv last summer at an unfortunately early time of the morning. I managed to get myself in a taxi from the Ben Gurion airport to the hotel that my mother had helped me find when I had been stressing out about where to stay in a new city in a faraway country I knew so little about. I know Mother's Day was last weekend, but thank you, Mom. When I got to the hotel, I wasn't going to be able to check in for several hours, so I left my bags at the hotel and went and got a bite to eat at a 24-hour restaurant located conveniently down the street. Then, after the sun came up, I decided to wander toward the sea with my book and eventually found this spot in the midst of old stone buildings tucked next to the blue waters of the Mediterranean. This little kiosk serving espresso and pastries had just opened for business, and I got what tasted like the most amazing latte in the world, and sat and read my book overlooking the Andromeda rock outcropping I mentioned before. Despite the worries lurking in the back of my head about how I was going to get myself and my suitcase to the campus of Hebrew University in Jerusalem a few days later, the breathtaking view and moment of pause was beginning to make me feel a bit of relief. After making it halfway across the world and on the cusp of settling in a little bit, I was starting to feel more self-assured that I could do this. My joy was impacted a bit after my Palestinian friend and former co-worker commented on the like-inducing picture I had posted on Facebook, thanks to the kiosk's free Wi-Fi. She was so excited for me and noted that I was in her parents' hometown and not far from the family home that neither she nor her family have been able to see since her parents fled the country during the violent conflict that birthed the na nation of Israel. History and geography, it turns out, are complicated. Another reason Jaffa, Jaffa, or Yafo is important to me is because of a brief tour of Tel Aviv I got to do on my second day in the country. The guide that took my group around the old port of Jaffa while we were standing on the top of the hill next to St. Peter's Church, our guide casually dropped the fact on us that this was the spot where Peter is believed to have had this vision that would play an important role in shaping how Christians and Christianity would understand their mission in the world. There is no way to know whether or not the events described in the Bible actually occurred in this exact spot. But is that really even the point? As with so many spots in Israel-Palestine, there are countless sites that have been venerated for thousands of years. At some point, whether we can prove the validity of these claims beyond a reasonable doubt becomes a moot point. The weight of tradition begins to take over, making it a meaningful spot by sheer will or countless repetition. For me, this direct connection to the story and having a point of reference for where the events are believed to have taken place changed how I experienced the story, giving it a new immediacy and importance for my life and my spiritual journey. It made this scriptural anecdote more meaningful for me, which, in my opinion, has a is a beautiful thing. Let us now return to the text itself. In terms of context, the passage from Acts is actually Peter recounting what happened just before this in the previous chapter, chapter 10. If we only look at our passage from chapter 11, we miss out on a number of important details that help us better understand the story and its significance. It is in chapter 10 that we are introduced to Cornelius, who lives in Caesarea. 
Caesarea is situated about 50 kilometers or 30 miles north of Jaffa. Cornelius is a centurion, a commander in the Roman army who the author of Acts highlights was a devout man who feared God with all his household. The text clarifies that this means Cornelius gives alms generously to the people and prays constantly to God. We are not told to what God Cornelius prays or what religion he subscribes to. The text only says to God, Theo, with a capital Theo. We can assume that Cornelius is a Gentile, the word used in chapter 10. The Greek word is alofulo, meaning foreigner or of another tribe or race. When he meets with Cornelius and his household, Peter says to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile, a foreigner. But it is the vision that Peter recounts in our reading for today that causes him to change his mind and to turn his back on scripture, custom, and the law to do what the Spirit of God is telling him to do. God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. In today's reading, Peter is retelling his story in order to defend his actions in the face of criticism from his fellow believers, the circumcised, as the scripture specifies. They are criticizing him for going against the law, for going in and eating with the other, the non-believer, the uncircumcised. Why, the scripture says, did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? There are some very strong in-crowd, out-crowd dynamics at play here related to religious practice and religious identity. Adherence to the law of Moses given in the Torah is of utmost importance, specifically the act of circumcision that serves as a key marker of who is in and who is out, who is fulfilling the covenant made between the God of Israel and God's people, and who is not. Peter, of course, is a good Jew and a follower of Jesus. For him, these two identities are not mutually exclusive. And Peter has just reminded us how important the observation and preservation of boundaries is to his people, the in crowd. Yet, God is saying something different, something new. What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This makes me think of the creation account in Genesis, when God declares his creation good on multiple occasions and very good in its totality. It is not hard to make the leap to how this relates to the present day. Examples abound in our intensely polarized world. The recent legislative moves in Georgia and Alabama are two of the most recent maneuvers of groups posturing for power and control deciding who has the right to decide about women's bodies, the lives and well-being of those yet to be born, and by whose ethical or religious standards all the above is to be judged. In crowd, out crowd. God-fearing, ungodly. Another example is the ongoing battles over the rights of all LGBTQ plus people to exist, to marry, to faithfully practice their religion, to serve God when God calls them to different vocations, and so on. Although not asked by his fellow believers about his audacity to baptize these Gentiles into the body of Christ, he tells them about the Holy Spirit de descending upon these outsiders, just as it had fallen upon the in-crowd at the beginning. Peter asks the important question, Who was I that I could hinder God? Who am I to stand in God's way? The words continue to ring in my ears. Professor of New Testament and early Christianity, the Reverend Dr. Mitzi Smith, who I first became familiar with this past January thanks to my incredible New Testament professor, the Reverend Dr. Shively Smith, no relation, provides some powerful insight in her commentary on this passage. Dr. Mitzi Smith notes that we need to allow our biases and stereotypes to be checked, and that we must engage with others different from ourselves in more than superficial ways. Us cannot keep our distance from them. 
The clean, unclean, in-crowd, out-crowd mentality only serves to perpetuate our belief in our own superiority. Far too easily we slip into defining ourselves by differentiating ourselves from others instead of basing our self-understanding upon who we are in God. Unfortunately, there is a collective nature at the heart of the good news we seek to proclaim. Our fates are tied directly to all those around us, not just the people we like or the folks we agree with. And our attempts to follow Jesus often look more like finding ways to avoid disrupting the boundaries and biases that safeguard our privilege. Smith also seeks to draw our attention to the fact that Peter fails to mention Cornelius by name in his retelling of the story in our reading today. Cornelius becomes the man, he or his, or you in the second person singular. Smith postulates that this is evidence of how difficult it can be to see others as fully human, fully equal, fully clean, after many years of viewing people and treating them as less than, something other than clean and human. Smith, Smith takes this even further, noting how many of us believe that we are not biased and do not see people differently. Smith writes, Many white brothers and sisters and some people of color deny that they ever perceive or treat people who are racially or economically different from themselves with bias. This is despite being entrenched in racialized, class-conscious institutions and traditions that presume people of color, women, and others to be inferior. These are uncomfortable ideas to hear and wrestle with, particularly for those of us who find ourselves among the privileged. I know that I want to believe that I do not see color, that I treat everyone the same, but what Bitsy and the authors of Acts are describing is something that is so deep-seated in human culture and human history that is easy to miss, overlook, or willfully ignore. It is as real now as it was 2,000 years ago. But there is hope. Smith notes that the only way we can begin to put an end to making distinctions between them and us is to learn to recognize and admit our biases and their impact on human relationships. The isms we face today, racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, and all the other biases, they are not godly. They are motivated by fear and not love. As we hear in today's reading, God does not show favoritism. And lucky for us, our God is a living, active God who is not afraid of crossing over, disrupting, and interrupting any boundaries we humans can construct. God's interaction with Cornelius is only one example of one-on-one -on -one encounters with humans, no matter what their religious affiliation or creed. As Smith says, God's Spirit will work despite, through, or prior to our ritual construction. There is always room for a clean start. And that invitation extends to everyone and anyone, those we agree with and those we don't. And like it or not, this includes those on the other side of the political spectrum for wherever we may find ourselves. I'll close with a beautiful reminder we heard in today's reading from John. Here, Jesus is speaking with his disciples, still at the Last Supper. Judas has just left to betray Jesus, his friend and teacher. And in response to that betrayal currently in progress, Jesus does not condemn Judas, nor speak angrily about what is happening to the remainder of his followers. He focuses on his mission and gives the disciples a new commandment, that they love one another. It is by their love that everyone will know these are Jesus' disciples. Lutheran pastor and New Testament scholar, Reverend Dr. Elizabeth Johnson, observes that Jesus does not say it will be by their theological correctness or their moral purity that they will be known as his followers. And as we see throughout the Bible, 
This love is a love that extends from mundane, everyday tasks such as washing the feet of friends, all the way to love that inspires heroic acts that involve great risk. The love Jesus describes encompasses everything in between. And taking a cue from our Trinitarian understanding of God and the love God shows for the whole world, the command to love one another cannot be limited only to the in-group. As we will sing shortly in our next hymn, in Christ there is no east nor west, in him no north or south. There is only one great fellowship of all people, and we are charged with spreading that love throughout the world. May God give us the strength and courage to recognize our biases where they exist and to do the work to remedy systems, institutions, traditions, and words that continue to inflict harm on our fellow human beings. Go and love, for it is how and how much we love that will make us known as followers of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>